Okay, welcome to C++ Boot Camp. And it says a uh, the door locks, actually. Oh, no, it doesn't. It opened up. And as the slide says, a review of your first C++ course. Well, I'm going to take it more like an introduction to C. So if you've never had C before, or never had C++ before, this is your first lecture. And uh, this is going to take about three weeks, eh, maybe two weeks. So we're going to spend three weeks and learn C++. And you're looking at me like, what? Actually, you can. You can learn the entire language in about three weeks, I think. Well, close to it. Close to it. Um, actually, by show of hands, how many people are brand new? That way I know what level of detail to provide. Brand new, never programmed in C, C++ before. OK, good. So I'll start down. What about you in the back? You're an experienced C++ programmer? No? OK, good. Then that way I'll just start real low, low, low basic level. And hopefully everybody, and if I get lost, if I'm going too fast, just slow me down and say, hey, I don't understand that. And uh, I'm also going to demo out Hello World using a compiler in the real world outside of PowerPoint. Uh, but I'll wait for a couple more slides. I want to go through some basic stuff first and then proceed for there. It is a compiled language, not like Java. So a lot of people these days are starting out with Java. They're learning how to program in Java, and then they're going backwards to C++. In the old days, it was C++. Actually, in the old days, you learned how to program in C. And then you learned C++, and then you learned Java. So it's all backwards now. Uh, so anyway, so C, going back to the skeleton, and as it, as it says here, skeleton, this is, this is as basic as you can get in terms of what um, a C program looks like. This is a fully functioning C program. It doesn't do anything. But it is a C program, so I want to just kind of start with a skeleton and move forward and tell you how to write stuff. This gets put into a notepad file, a text file. I mean, in the old days, they used VI or they used Nano, or they used, now we use Notepad because we're on Windows. We write the source code in Notepad, we take and we compile it. And I'm going to demo this with Eclipse as the browser on a Windows platform. So, although I have a Mac over here, and you're going to see Windows, I have it built in parallels. So we'll hit see that works. And then every week I'll show you in a Windows environment um, all the um, things that we're doing in terms of the programming syntax. So we have a few things to look at in terms of the skeleton. Um, we have this thing up here, this is this number sign, include. This is kind of like the uh, same concept as including a package in Java, if you're familiar with that. And we have this iostream.h up here at the top. Some compilers take the .h, some don't. Um, and then we have this void main here. And it has an opening and a closing bracket. This is called a function. So in C++ and also in C, actually the only difference is which libraries are you using. In both the languages, C and C++, we always have a main. And the main is what starts out the, the functioning of the program. Uh, so here's our main. It doesn't have any parameters. If we had parameters, it would be inside of these brackets right here. Void means that we're not going to return a value. Otherwise, we would put a data type. The data type that we specify for the function is the value that, uh, that would be returned from the function. And um, what we're looking at here is everything that, uh, go ahead, memorize this, and it has to be there. This is the requirement. Um, and this goes in a file with a .c++ file extension on it. Um, if you don't put it in a C++ file extension, depending upon the compiler, it might actually take a C if you're writing just C code. So we had .c's and we had .c++'s to say that this is C++. It just means it's looking for a different library set. And in terms of in the library set, we're looking up up here would be in terms of the include. So what I want to do is kind of show you what it looks like out in the real world. And uh, go to a Windows. Here we go. This is a Windows partition on this Mac. And uh, one, I'm going to let me make this bigger here. There we go. A little bigger. Um, I've actually created a project already. This is Eclipse, by the way. Uh, this is the program I had you download last week. So if you haven't downloaded it, uh, go to, uh, um, I'm sorry, this is not Eclipse. This is Dev C++. <laughs> I go to the bloodshed. Um, in fact, if you go to uh, Windows, if you missed last week, I'll just go through it real quickly here so you know what I'm looking at. Uh, go, to, go to Google, open up a web browser, go to Google, type in uh, Dev C++ or Bloodshed. 
Uh, let's see if I have an internet connection. I may not actually have a connection right now. Um, if I don't have a connection, I'll skip it. Looks like I've... Oh, no, no, no. Looks like I don't have a connection. All right. So, uh, blood shed. B-L-O-O-D-S-H-E-D or dev C++ um, is what you're looking for. And when you, when you uh, download it and you install it, you get this little... It's hard to see it. This is dev C++. You get a little icon. You click on the icon. Brings up Dev C++. A really easy install, actually. It um, works on all versions of Windows. It does not work on a Mac, which is why I have this loaded in a Windows partition. You don't have to use this. So you could use uh, you know, JGrasp or one of the Eclipse browsers. There's a tons of different free, this is free, IDEs that you can use for this course. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll put together a YouTube video how to install C++ on your computer. <laughs> so. Um, so look forward to that. I'll put the link in the class uh, in the class notes, and I'll talk about it next week. I haven't recorded it yet, but that may not be a bad idea because some people have never even used a C compiler before. And so if, that, if you're that low, you're starting at that basic level, you might have some difficulties installing the software. Um, so if you want to do, if you want to practice, you can go File New. You can open up a source file, or you can open up a project. If you open up a project in this particular example, you'd select project and you'd select type of project. For this particular class, we're creating DOS console applications. We're not going to use GUI. We're not going to do any GUI programming in this class. So everything we're going to do is going to be command based or console. So if you go project new, you could do Windows if you want, but you have a bunch of extra stuff in there you don't need. I would just select the uh, console application and I'm going to call this one project, uh, project test that and I'm going to select OK and then it's going to ask for me for a location and I'm going to put it in here in the dev C++ directory. Now I have project test and project test has one file and this one file is called main.c++ which happens to be the file. Maybe I can make this a little bigger. Um, oops, no, that's not how you do it. Uh, plus. No. Uh, no. Uh, okay. Well, let's try to make it bigger. I can just put that. Oh, we got a little bigger. Uh, okay, so you probably can't see it if you're sitting far away. <laughs> but uh, you're going to get, uh, you can see it if you watch the video, you'll probably see it a little clearer. Uh, but what you're going to get is a template, which is basically what I just showed you a few minutes ago. However, it's a little different. Um, actually, let me see if I can get this a little bigger. Control, shift. No. Nope. You guys remember, uh, no, I wish I remembered it. It's like shift, shift, uh, no, there's a keyboard combination of zoom in, uh, but uh, I'm not finding it right now. Unless somebody in the class knows on a Mac, zoom in quick, no, okay, forget it. Uh, all right, so. Uh, the project itself for a DOS console application, and we have main.c++ is what it says up here. I'll just read it off to you. It's up here. You can't see it's so small. And uh, this is what I just showed you in that slide a few minutes ago. And uh, there's a little bit of a couple of differences in here. We have a couple of different libraries. We don't actually need this one up here. I'm going to take that one away. Uh, this one says include iostream dot nothing. It just says include iostream. Um, just like the slide I just showed you, some compilers require that dot h, some don't. The um, opening and the closing brackets here, you can see that the little arrows that are around the IO stream, I mean, look for it in the same directory path. It's basically, instead of specifying out a directory itself, if you put the quotation marks, if I change this and put a quotation mark here and here, that means look for it in the current directory. And the uh, opening and closing brackets basically is telling me look for it in the directory, subdirectory path. So wherever, and then I saved it in D, is C++, dev, C++, so it's going to look for it from there. And it's going to be in the bin directory probably. Or, actually, it's probably going to be the lib directory is where it's going to be. Um, and then I have this using namespace. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but just to give you a little brief introduction in namespaces, we have these libraries that I'm including at the top here. And uh, they're part of the environment space. So I'm loading in iostream.h. iostream's got cn, cout, all of the different functions for system IO. I'm actually not even doing any of them in here, really. Um, but rather than, um, rather than include um, 
all of the different library space libraries that are possible. I could just say using namespace standard STD, which is right here. And then you'll be able to see when I bring up the slide set, it'll be a bit, a bit bigger for you, the one sitting far away from the slide set here. Um, but uh, it basically says, well, load the standard namespace STD. And uh, when using it, it's going to load all the standard libraries that you would normally use. So I didn't actually, in this example, it wouldn't even have to include IOStream. I could probably just leave that off. Uh, Dev requires a C++, uh, Microsoft C++, the .NET does not require any namespaces to be used at all. So it's one of those compiler specific things, which is why when you, ever, when you ever install new software and you're running with a brand new compiler you've never used before, always look for like the hello world sample or go to project new and create a default and make sure it compiles essentially. Um, and then you see what, what needs to be in there by default. And uh, just like the slide a few minutes ago had uh, main, the slide we had before had uh, void main, which meant it didn't return a value. This one has int. You can see int right here. Actually, I'll show you with the mouse. It's probably a little bit easier. You can see int right here before main. This is a data type, and it's a data type that's associated with the function. <coughs> so in C++ and also in C, a lot of the languages, our data, we recognize it by a type, and we call them by different types. We have floats, doubles, integers. And all of the functions have to, you have to specify a type as well. So all the functions will have one of these built-in data types. And I'll talk about data types a little bit more as we go through the lecture as well. Um, and then inside of main, we have this command line argument that comes in as an array, which you probably don't know about arrays yet, but uh, or maybe you do from other programming languages. Um, what we're doing is we're using parameters in here to capture those arrays information. So we have integer argument, which is going to be a number argument for the number of arguments that come in. And then here we're going to have the values of those arguments that are separated usually by spaces. Um, and I'll talk about that again as a little bit further we get through, but I'm basically going over the, the template for you. We also have this other thing called uh, system pause, which is kind of unique to Dev C++ as well. Microsoft and Windows has this very unique feature called close on exit. When you write DOS console applications, the window will close for you automatically, and I'll show you how that works in a few minutes. Um, so you can't see what's on the screen. It automatically just flashes and closes. And uh, so this is the only reason why we have that in there, is that we can pause, and I'll see, we'll see what the pause looks like in a few minutes and show you. Um, this one under here, return exit success. Well, the uh, type of the type of function we have is an integer function. So, because we said int main up here. So we're, we're actually looking for a number like 0, 1, 2, 3, an integer value. Exit success is a built-in uh, variable inside the dev C++ compiler that equals 0. <laughs> you know, so I actually replaced it and put 0 on there because how are you going to know about all these built-in functions unless you go through all of or built-in uh, variables unless you go through all of the documentation for, the, for, for dev and then that's not going to work in another compiler. So we're just going to say return zero here. And if I compile this, if I go project, execute, compile, and run up here, where I press F9, it, uh, it's going to ask me to save it. I'm going to save it as, uh, let's just call this main2, because I don't want to overwrite this other main that I have out here. And, uh, and when I run it, this is all I get. I get a little DOS window that comes up, and the DOS window says, uh, Press any key to continue. Well, that's what my pause is doing. So if I comment out, and let me show you comments real quick. In uh, other languages, it's usually two forward slashes that uh, provide on. I'll go over the syntax in a few minutes as well, but um, works in C++ as well. Or the old style also works. And um, if you do the two pluses, the two lines, excuse me, it comments out line by line, the entire line. If you go with the choice of the line and the asterisk, it'll comment out everything in between the line and the asterisk. So you can go like that and come out, out the line. But that's C, actually. C++ is the two lines. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back here and just change it to the two lines. Now I'm going to show you what happens when, you, uh, com when I comment out that line. I mean, we're going to see that flashing bug. We're going to see the Windows bug. That's what we're going to see. We're not going to be able to see the program. So if I go like here and I say uh, compile and run, I just compiled it. Now it's running. Did you guys see that window? <laughs> Let me do it again. I'm just going to go run this time. Now watch carefully. 
program's going to run. See it? <laughs> I, I guarantee I'm going to get 20 students, 20 or 30 students, a minimum. They're going to send me an email message and says, my program, when I run it, it just flashes on the screen and goes away. It's a Windows bug. That's what this is. It happens with all compilers. It's because of close on exit. It's set for command line prompts. If you're bringing up a command line prompt, and Windows says by default, when the program's done, exit. And this program isn't doing anything, but nothing at all, so it's, it's going to exit. So if I uncomment this, then if I compile and run it, and I'm going to go through all these commands as we start writing programs, so I'm just trying to demo certain things. Now I got the window, it stays up. That's where this press any key to continue is that pause command. And that pause command is running system pause. And uh, there's many different ways you could actually get a character if you wanted to. Some people use get character. Some people use, and I'll show you a couple of different options as we go through the course. Yeah, there are different ways of stopping that window. So, you know, if I wanted to print something to the screen and pause the screen, you could actually see it. So the template, which is kind of cool when you automatically create a project, puts stuff in there for you. Now, I created another, pro another one here that... Uh, another project in here that demos um, I.O. So if I go, if I just close this here, um, I could go, you know, open, let me just open another one. Um, open a project or file. Let's open up this one here. Mm, I just want to close project test. Yes. Every time you open up a new project, it will close the, um, the, the, the one that was previously open. This one's not too bad. Um, and you see this is another project I created. This one is a little bit in more interesting because it asks for input and output. And I'm going to go through the lecture and show you how to use these commands in a few minutes. But just to demo this before I go back to the PowerPoint. Um, this is going to be uh, Hello World plus a little bit. And uh, what we have in this project is we're still using iostream.h. But I'm saying include uh, iostream. So keep opening and closing brackets. And same kind of format. And then underneath that, I have another include. I have another include called string or string class that I'm using. And string is uh, going to allow me to use this variable type string, which is not a built-in variable type. So what I've got here, again, is using namespace standard. So the top of the programs are always going to look the same. Here, I don't actually have to use this here. I could actually pull this out because I'm not taking any command line arguments. If I were taking... And what I mean by command line arguments is if I were at a DOS prompt and I typed in the name of the program to run my executable file, I can go in the name of the program, space, argument one, argument two, argument three. And then it would take that information and populate it in and use that information inside of the program. Um, same thing that happens in other programming languages. Uh, but uh, I'm not really going to use anything, so I can pull that out. And uh, so now I have string name, so I have my first variable that I've declared, and I'll talk about variables in a few. And then I have C out. This is what makes C out and C in. This is what makes C++ different from C. Because some of you have probably used C before in the past. And if you had, you used stdio.h, standard IO library. that had printf. And uh, sometimes it had uh, scanf in there as well. Oh, both, all of them do. Um, so it's input and output. So what we're looking at here in IO stream is the IO stream input and output equivalent. So this is the C++ version of the I.O., excuse me, STDIO, standard I.O. in C. And the library calls are a little different. So new people to C++ generally have to get familiar with C in and C out. That's what they're going to use. And uh, there are other differences with C++, but that's what we're taking this class for. So you're, you're, we're going to go through all of the different things about objects and all the different things about creating. And everything is considered an object in C++. So... Here I created a, an object named name, and it's a variable type string, which is very similar to how you create a variable. Say integer i. You create a variable called i with a data type integer. Here we have string name. The data type is string. The name of the string is name. And uh, interesting thing with uh, C in and C out is it's easier than printf and scanf. In scanf, you actually have to say read in from scanf is the one that says read in from the input, from the keyboard, and put it into a data type string. In the C in and C out equivalent, you don't have to, have to mention anything about data types. So 
And here I've got a C out, which is output, and I'm going to go through all of this stuff more formally in a few minutes, but C out, and it's going to say, and then I'm giving it a string, and I'm using these things called directional, they're actually directional arrows. It comes from Unix, actually. Um, and C out basically allows you to print stuff to the screen, and then C in here allows you to take stuff in from the screen and put it into a variable automatically. So this particular program asks for a name, you enter the name, and then it prints out. And it prints out the name, you know, thanks, name, uh, goodbye, that's about it. So it's, it's hello world plus a little bit. And then um, the interesting thing about seeing and seeing out though is you can string stuff together. Uh, so here I've got, not only am I printing out thanks, I'm also printing out the name variable that I just see in. And I'm also printing a goodbye, and then end line is basically saying, give me a line return. Take me to the next line. And then underneath it, I just showed you, it doesn't have to really even be there, just how to print out an end line. Put another line return in there. Um, and then I've got the system pause, which we've seen already in the last example. And then I've got uh, return zero. That's basically saying, we're done, you know, return from the function. And I'm going to go through all of this in a few minutes. So... This is not your complete introduction to this. Um, what I'm doing is showing you how to run a program and the parts of the program. Right? So, lo and behold, I usually have a student at this point goes, that's way fast. <laughs> that's not how I learned C. OK, no, don't worry about it. This is, we're going to go through a lot more in a few minutes. <laughs> so, if I run this, uh, what am I looking at? I'm going to go say compile and run. And uh, I'm running it right now. Oops. And it's going to say, hello there. Uh, please enter your name. So I'm going to enter my name, Barbara. And then I'm going to press return. It says, thanks, Barbara. Goodbye. You can't see it. I'm sort of reading it to you, but that's what it says right here. And then press any key to continue. So basically, it's an upgraded version. And I'll put these up on the website. What you're going to do between now and next week is uh, maybe download this, maybe create a Hello World, maybe, just, maybe mimic this once you learn how to do it. And then That'll give you good practice for just getting your compiler ready to go and getting familiar with the basic syntax of how to write a Hello World program. So let's go back and take a look at Hello World um, so you can get a feel for that. So those of you who came in late, you just missed my... Uh, this is what it looks like in the real world. Now this is what it looks like on PowerPoint. <laughs> so, so what I did is I just kind of showed you briefly. And for those of you who couldn't see... Couldn't see dev C++, this is what I'm talking about. And here we have the dot .h. In my program, I didn't have the dot .h because dev didn't require it. But it's still a file, and inside, if you looked at system, if you looked at io stream dot .h, you'll see a bunch of functions in there defining a bunch of libraries and stuff. And one of them is the cn, and one of them is the cout. And then we have the main function. Every single program in C or C++ must have a main which is kind of different than Java. Java, you don't really need to call main on everything. Um, you only need to call main in a class that's actually going to be the start that's going to actually perform the functionality of, and maybe exercise some of the other classes. So. so documenting your program. So let's start with the first thing and the easiest thing to do in C++ is to write comments. <laughs> so, and uh, this is called commenting, obviously. And the computer ignores this in the compilation. There are two ways to comment in C++, and this is what I demoed for you a few minutes ago. So we have the single line comment. If you're going to put a comment all in one line, which makes a lot of sense, because you might go, you know, integer i, and then you might have a space and go comment. Um, i is going to hold the counter variable information or something. And then you might, in the next line, in the next line. So if you're going to use the whole line, use the double, double slashes. If you're going to do an opening and a closing, this is the more the C style. This is the syntax for it, so a paragraph of comments can go. So it doesn't matter until you see this closing. So anything from the start, you can expand multiple lines. So the first thing, like a lot of brand new C programmers like to do, is put a big old header on the top of their program <laughs> and space it out. I don't know why people do that. Half the code is the header, and then you've got a header. What I mean is by that is you know all of the you know this program is written by so and so and this date for this class, and the program does this and this and this. People get carried away with that. You don't have to do any of that for this particular course. In fact, you don't even have to comment in this course. But you'll find yourself commenting because it helps you remember what you've written and why you why you're using a variable, stuff like that. And it helps other people troubleshoot your code when they're looking at it. 
So let's talk about printing to the screen. This is the function I just demoed for you. You use an, what's in blue is the syntax. And we call it, we pronounce it C out. It's not count, it's C out. And then we have C in, oh, so there's on the next slide. And uh, we use C out to do this. And uh, C out can print out just about anything. It prints out variables, it prints out text strings, and then if you saw, if you remember, when you looked at it, I had some quotation marks with some text strings. And you have to put text in quotes. Variable names you don't have to put in quotes, it reads it like a variable. Um, multiple things at once can be stringed together, and special characters can be used this forward slash n, which is really C syntax. I used n line but you can actually put in, and these are called escape characters, escape sequences. You can put those in if you wanted to as well. Same ones that are supported, believe it or not, with printf in the old C days. So C++ is really an extension on C. It includes everything in C plus. So it's, that's what they call it, the plus plus. You know, plus added libraries plus object orientation. So we've got an addition. And we can print multiple things out uh, with additional... Uh, and I'll show you another example as well coming up with you know, additional uh, directional arrows. So you print out an end line. This is what I demoed before. I had to drop to the next line. It's like a line return. So, so the end, E-N-D, L-L is the syntax for that. So let's take a look at some of the um, um, programming language syntax. This is a little easier to see than the example that I just gave you. This is the, the boot camp lecture if you're looking for it. And uh, <clears throat> so let's look at C out and how that's used. What we've got is C out, and uh, here's how I remember how to C in and C out arrows work. You know, if you um, you know you're at a ball game, you got one of those things that has got blow horns. They you know when you, when you blow, you um, you yell into these things, and it amplifies your voice. What are those called? Uh, speaker things. Uh, what do they call those things? Nobody knows. You guys know what I'm talking about? It looks like a cone. And then you put the small end into your mouth and you go, ah! and it amplifies. It's, a, you know, it's this little thing that is going out this way and gets bigger this way. Uh, so see how it kind of blows into one of these horns. And you always use two of them together. I'm not even quite sure why, but the syntax for it, and this is the interesting thing, this is the hardest thing for people to get used to. Because in C, you just wrote fun and called functions. In C++, you're actually using objects, but you don't know it yet. So when people first get encountered with C and C out, they go, why do you have to use those directional arrows? Well, think of it, this is blowing out. And so what are you blowing out? You're going to blow it out to the screen. It's going to show up on the console screen for you. And what's going to show up in this particular case is this is a sample string. And you may also notice at the end of this line, we've got a semicolon. So like in other programming languages, every line ends with a semicolon. Yep. Um, so we have C out, and we have another one, my integer. That's a variable name. We haven't shown you how to declare it yet, but that's a variable name that's printing out. And then we've got it nested here. So now we have two. We have one set of uh, directional out and another set of directional outs. So we've nested. So this is basically showing you can print multiple items. You don't have to go each line of a new item, which is interesting. It makes it more, uh, more, more effective. And then here we have, uh, you know, C out. C plus plus scares me. And then we have C out. Hello world with an end line. Um, everything is going to be scrunched up next to each other. So we have this is going to be printed right next to this, right next to this, right next, no spaces. So if you're using this method to print stuff to the screen, you might notice here there's an extra space in here which means I've got to put that space in, because it's all going to be concatenated when it goes out. So you have to put your own space in. So it's kind of like you know having to put a space in with printf, if you're familiar with that, or other things. So, And if you're a Java person, this is equivalent to system.out. <laughs> so it's kind of the same concept. It's just used in a lot of different ways. So in Java, we have system.in. In C, we have C in. Uh, so in C in, it's kind of the same thing. It's pronounced C in, and that's in. Uh, so you read in, you read into variables. So I'll discuss variables in a few minutes. Um, here's an example. 
You're going to declare a variable. So now we have some green comments. And this is an interesting syntax. It's the same thing you're going to find in uh, Dev C++ and also in Microsoft uh, Visual C++. Everybody likes green. You see green, in fact, this is the great thing about using an IDE versus Notepad. The text on your screen will be color coordinated. <laughs> so everything in green is a comment. Variables, um, the text themselves are sometimes in blue, the very or red. Uh, Eclipse, I believe, uses red for them. The variables are usually in blue, which is interesting. Or the data types are normally in blue. Um, so you'll start noticing the colors, and that actually helps you identify different parts of the program as you're learning it. So here we're going to use cn, and uh, we got an integer, uh, my int, which is how we're declaring an, an integer value that we're going to hold an integer in it, and the name of the integer is going to be called my int. You can call it anything you want. There are some rules, and I'll go over those in a few. But right now we're just take this for granted. It's a data type integer, int, and we're going to load this information from the keyboard. So we go cn. And then notice the arrows are in the opposite direction. Because <laughs> the input is coming in through this direction through the blow horn. A blow horn, that's what it is. When you blow into this horn and it makes amplifies a sound. And you can speak through it. You know what I'm saying? You know at a baseball game and you're trying to cheer on your you're a fan and you're trying to cheer. You know, cheerleaders use it, you know, yell, chant stuff to the crowd. <laughs> well C plus plus use it to throw stuff out on the system on the console screen and to get stuff on the console screen. So now we got our blowhorn going in the opposite direction because we're reading it in. So that's how you can remember the directional arrows because the first thing you're going to do when you write your first C program is you're going to get the arrows in the wrong direction. Everybody does that. So oh, you'd be using only one set of arrows in one direction. No, they both they go they go both ways. They go in and they go out. So and uh, now we're going to print it out. So now we see the direction of the arrows have changed. So we have a CN my integer. <coughs> this command, you kind of just have to memorize it. You're going to say, give me input, c in, and give me my int. Put it to my int. It doesn't really look like that's what's happening, but um, unfortunately, it's like one of those things that you have to kind of just get used to and take for granted. Um, so, c out, my int is, and I'm going to put a little space here, and then we have my int. So, you could theoretically put it all together, but it's clear, easier to read it this way. Actually, and I'll talk about how to format the code in a few minutes because sometimes it's easier to present things in a certain way versus other ways of presenting it. So here's some examples of CN. Notice all of the arrows for CN will always go in the opposite direction because we're reading in instead of amplifying out. And uh, now we have age and name coming through. And what ends up happening in this case is it takes the first input and applies it to age, and the second input and applies it to name. So if I did that, it would you know, say, enter name and age, and then underneath I go CN age and name. So I type in, you know, my age, you know, 21 space, <laughs> right? <laughs> my name, or whatever it is I was putting in there, and then, you know, separated by a space. And it actually parses it that way. So once you get used to that, you'll, you'll go, oh, this is a lot better than C. Yeah. C, the old days, it was, you had to do more formatting with the print in, print out, and scan out. So chaining uh, the stream operation, it's really called IO stream because it is streamed input that's coming in, and you're parsing it essentially with C in and C out. And uh, so there's no limit to the number of things that you can print and read to the screen. And uh, simple changing them together, in terms of chaining them together with this, we have C out, uh, first item, second item. We've got them chained together because we've got it separated by the directional uh, arrows. And then here we have a list of some of the new escape sequences uh, that you might want to get familiar with. Um, if you want to put a tab in, if you want to put a line return in. Um, in terms of adding, added with the string, it performs special characters. So we have a, a new line carriage return tab. People generally just look this stuff up when they need it. And go, well, do I need to put a new line in at the end? So, in fact, a lot of people don't like to use these escape characters because they're kind of hard to memorize. So they get used to end line, and they use that to put a line return in, so you don't have to worry about it. So let's go back to the first C++ program, Hello World. And now we've added something to it. So this is the same program we looked at before, and it should be put in a file called C++. So it's a text file, again. 
You don't have to use Eclipse for it, uh, but you can, actually. And so we have the include iostream.h void main c out hello world. So there's your hello world in the C++ world. And uh, this is the easiest program you could possibly write. Every program has to have at least one function, that main. So if you, if you get used to that concept, and the void, which is acceptable. So void means nothing's going to be returned. So let's take a look at some rules. So, because we want to extend our knowledge past hello world eventually. So, rules about the syntax. So, where do the semicolons go? Hmm, after everything. <laughs> so, semicolons come after single statements and similar to a period at the end of a sentence. So, if you notice up there, we have a semicolon. We only had one statement, really. Semicolon at the end of the statement. This is our one statement in here. We don't actually have to put a semicolon after the function. So this would be our function. That would be a line statement, line of code, and after each one of the statements. We don't put a semicolon up here either, and that's something you just have to memorize. So other languages, you put semicolons in different spots, but includes don't need it, and neither do functions. So, but all the other statements do. Where do you put the opening and the closing brackets? Where do they go? Well, before the opening and the closing to block the code. So they start in the stop of the function, which tells us that when we've created main, we're going to start main and now we're going to end main. So this is our starting and this is our ending of our function. Other programming languages don't use brackets at all, but you have to use them in C++ and C as well. Uh, so uh, what we got here is it creates a block of text, multiple single statements that are part of the function. So this one tells us that we're going to begin a section, and this one tells us we're going to end the section, and you can nest them inside of each other. So you can nest uh, opening and closing brackets of blocks of code. So whenever you're creating a block, you're going to associate with something. People have a tendency in the beginning to overuse the block codes, the, the block opening and closing curly brackets, or they do the opposite and they leave them out completely. So you'll get used to when you need to use them, and basically the only way you can really do that is with practice. So let's go back to our first C++ program and analyze it back. Back, Just going to put the pieces together. So we have our beginning and our ending opening bracket, and we have our end of the single statement here. So this is about, um, this is about all I can really comment on in terms of Hello World, because we don't really have very much going on in terms of that program. And stop me if um, there's something in particular you wanted to know a little bit more about. I can go a little bit lower, but I'm trying to I'm trying to go slow and cover a lot of basic stuff for people who've never actually programmed in a language before. But I know some of you probably are familiar with Java. And you're looking at this going, speed it up a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. OK, so let's compile. Uh, this is where the compilers come into play. And we have ANSI C compiler. And we have C++ compatible compilers. Interesting thing about Java is there's only one language, it's Java. We have one choice, the Java compiler. C is interesting. It's universal. It's standardized. So we have GCC. We have CC. We have Visual, Basic, Visual C++. We have the Eclipse, which is a GNU C, GCC compiler. If it's NCC compliant, it works with any one of those compilers, which is great because you can download source code off the internet. And it could be C code. It could be C++ code and it's going to work with any one of your compilers. Perhaps with some minor changes. And one of them that I mentioned already was that dot .h instead of, you know, or locations of libraries. Um, but the basic syntax, the basic libraries are the same. Um, which is kind of interesting, especially if you went backwards and you learned Java first, and then your next language is C++ or C. You're going, well, what compiler? There's no such thing as an Eclipse program versus a C++ Visual C++ Microsoft program, it's the same source code, so, which is great because now you've learned all of those different languages. You know, it's all one language, different IDs is what the difference is. Which is different from the Java thinking because you know, Java is Java. There's no such thing as a non-Sun, or shall I say Oracle. Or there's, <laughs> there's no such thing as a non-Java compiler. So, All right, so you're going to use one of two things, your command line. G++ on Unix, or maybe you're going to use an IDE like Visual C++. You can use anything you want for this course. All of the syntax is going to work on every compiler. And when you compile, you're going to have one of two things happen. It's either it compiles or it doesn't compile. Same thing happens in Java. If it doesn't compile, you're going to have a syntax error. 
if it does compile it, you're going to have an exe file. You're not going to have a com file. You're going to have an exe, stands for executable file, purely for Windows. This does not work in the Mac world. So C++ is Unix, excuse me, Unix or Windows compatible. Works. In fact, it came from Unix. It got converted to Windows. Java is everything. Java works on the Mac, works on Windows, works on Unix. So C++ is not as general, which is why a lot of people are learning Java these days instead of C++. Uh, so knowing when to compile. Interesting. This is just programming practice, and this is some words of um, advice to brand new programmers who have never programmed before. Uh, save often, compile often. <laughs> it's kind of like when you write a program in any language at all. Uh, when you're comfortable with it, save it because you can isolate errors and you can basically do your own debugging. Or you can use the debugging tools of the IDEs. Uh, and if you're not familiar at all with programming, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. And uh, depending upon what you're using, the tools and options for debugging might look like French or Spanish or English. Or so. they, might, uh, they might look foreign to you. Uh, and uh, they're very hard to use and they're very, nobody spends very much time perfecting the debugging tools. So it's better to use your own philosophy and just save often and compile often. And uh, don't become dependent on the compiler either. So you sit there and, and you fix things so that it that works in the compiler, and uh, which is the interesting phenomenon that occurs in almost any programming language. People make changes so that it compiles. And the changes make absolutely no logical sense at all. They're just following the error messages and they're fixing the code. But the error messages don't know the logic you're using. So it's, it messes up your code sometimes. All right, so let's start in with some basic concepts in terms of variables. Um, might be too low, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up a couple of notches of abstraction and assume you understand the concept of a variable, which is a name, space, and memory, holding a, a, a piece of data that you want to use throughout the program. So the computer program manipulates the data, and there's a need to store data, so we have variables that represent cell memory locations. Interesting thing in C++ that we don't have in Java is we have pointer variables, we have named variables, we have built-in variables, and user-defined variables, which is kind of interesting, because uh, we have abstract data types that we can create, uh, which we don't really do very much creation of in terms of Java outside of creating a class. So in Java, we have the abstract data type called the class. In C++ and C, we have structures which is not a class, and, or we have type defines, or we can make our own variable, user-defined variables. Uh, we can make our own data types. Uh, it's kind of interesting. We have a little bit more flexibility, and what that flexibility causes more complications and confusion, but uh, it's not bad if you kind of take a look at each one of them individually. But let's start with variables. We have declaration and initialization, same thing we have in Java. So when you declare a variable, you open up a computer's memory space, and when you identify it, you have given it a name. Uh, so you only need to do this once per variable, and we have to give it a data type. So we're saying we want an integer space, we want a double space, we want a float space. And we're going to call this float space um, salary, or this double space we're going to call salary. Um, so the data type comes first. So the data type is any kind of information that you want to hold. The type uh, are built into the language. So some of the types um, we're going to define ourselves, such as the structure, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. We also have enumeration types in C++ that we don't have in Java. Uh, so here's some different forms. We have primitive and complex. So primitive data types are built into the language. That's that integer that we've seen so far. Uh, complex ones are ones that we might create ourselves or they might hold more than one data, like arrays as an example. And we have arrays in other languages as well. So let's look at some examples. The primitive data type, simplest one to use, and this is what we're going to use for the first couple of weeks of this course. Uh, integer, short, long. Uh, in fact, the way you memorize these is you can find out which ones you're using more often. You remember those. Everyone uses an integer. Uh, the short and the long are just different specifications of integers. Because just like Java, the data type has an interesting characteristic to it. There's a name for the data type. Here we have short, integer, and long. There's an, a range of allowable values for the data type. 
which is where these are differing. So small integers are shorts. Uh, regular large average size integers are integers. Big integers are long, uh, very large numbers. And uh, you might be sitting here going, why do we have three different types of integers? Why don't you just make one and call it an integer? <laughs> well, Java is interesting because Java has built-in garbage collection. It has cleanup work, and we can just have integer. And that's all we really have, actually, in Java. We do have the extended types, but nobody ever uses them. Everyone just uses integer for everything. If you want an integer, say integer. In C++, we can write programs that work in small little embedded devices that don't have very much memory. Or we don't have, well, we don't have garbage collection. When we use memory, it's used for the entire duration of the program. So we want to be conservative. If we have a real small number, like we're going to, you know, say, okay, user, enter a number between 1 and 10. I'm going to use a short for that. Because <laughs> we're only going to reserve space for a two-digit decimal number. If we used a long for that, we'd be wasting space. Because we go out in the memory, and we reserve a space that could fit a long value. Well, we're only going to put, you know, enter a number between 1 and 10. And so we can be more conservative with C++ in terms of specifying our data that we're storing. We actually have to do that because we have to manage our own data in C++. Java does it for us. C++, we have more control over the memory usage. So when we start talking about pointers, that will make a lot more sense to you as well in terms of how you can directly access memory through pointers to the memory instead of using what's called the named variables, which is what we're talking about now. So name variables are identifier variables that we give a data type and a name to, like integer i. Um, that's not a pointer. So the number of bytes it takes up depends on the compiler and also the operating system. So if you're on a Unix system, that short might take up, I don't know, some two bytes or something, <laughs> or it might take up three bytes. Or on a Windows system, it might have a different spec associated with it. So we have decimal numbers as well. So what we're looking at is single value, integer value numbers in this first slide. Second one is your decimals. You got your float and your doubles. And if you want precision, you go for the double, but you got short. It's a shorter number. If you want imprecision, you go for the float, but you can store larger values, and you can do more calculations on it. So float is less precise than a double. Double is more precise than a float, but it's less memory. So a lot of people go float around the board because it gives them your maximum space allotments that you can use. And the devil's a little bit more secure. So if you're writing a financial application and you're keeping dollar values, you know, if you have a large number space, then you're not going to have rounding problems. Yeah, hopefully you're not. But there's rounding issues with floats, depending upon processors, map processors. So you get your ups and downs with that. So the precision means how many numbers come after the decimal points. You get all of them. So when you print them out to the screen, you can determine what precision you want. So you can do your own rounding in terms of uh, taking it down to two. So you can apply your own. Others you might have, uh, here's an example of characters or Boolean. Boolean is a true or false value that's associated with a variable. And then our characters are often mere characters. You can store a number in character space as well. So here's an example of how to declare a variable and what actually happens with the computer's memory. So we have the format, we have the data type that comes first. We don't use these brackets. This is just for illustrative purposes. And we have the variable name. So the variable name, you can choose almost anything you want. I'll go over the rules in a few minutes. But here's some examples. So we have byte age, float GPA, uh, string name. Uh, that's the one I showed you actually in the, in the Hello World example. Or character letter grade. Out here in the computer memory, we have age, GPA, name, letter grade. We access the variables by their names. And we'll see when we're looking at pointers, we can access them by their spaces instead of their names. Uh, but in this particular case, we're using variables. So how big is it? Remember I mentioned that each one of these variables has a size associated with it? Well, we can actually get the size. So we can run a variable size of, excuse me, run a function or method, I should say, size of on a variable. And it can tell us how big it is. Because uh, if we're trying to be conservative, you know, we can check the size to make sure it's big enough before we store something there or create another variable if we want instead. So size of, excuse me, will tell us how much uh, 
memory, something will take up in bytes. So here's the usage here. We have um, integer my int. So it's going to give us an integer size, essentially. And then uh, see out size of my int, depending upon what you've got stored in there. It's going to tell you what size or how much memory has been taken up. Why do we want to do that? In C and C++, we have to do type casting if we want to add an integer with a float. Somewhere. You know, we have to convert variables. And when we convert variables, we have to know that the variables can actually fit in the space that we're converting it to. If it's too big, we're going to lose precision, and we're going to end up with you know, garbage, essentially, as a result. So. We have a lot of reserved words in C++. You can't use them for variable names. So here's a list here. These are the words that are special. And uh, here's a list of auto, bull, break, case, you know, because all, these are all functionalities. So you can use practically anything for a variable name, but you cannot use a, rever a reserved word. So you can't say integer auto or integer bull or something. It's going to come out with an error. So. Legal variable names, here's the rules, actually. It can't be a reserve word, I previously mentioned, and nobody goes and memorizes the reserve words. As you learn the language, you know which ones are reserved because they're part of the language syntax. It cannot begin with a number, and believe it or not, these are the same as Java. So if you're familiar with Java, these rules are identical. I uh, can't begin, can't contain special symbols, like a space, you can't put a space in there. And you can't put any of these other symbols in there either. Because these are special symbols that are used in the language and it'll get confused. Now this one is what we saw already that used right before and include. So if you put that in a variable name, it's going to go, what? When it parses the language, it's not going to know what it is. And uh, the exception here, you can use an underscore and you can also use a dollar sign. So believe it or not, you can only use these two special characters in um, a C++ variable name. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So here are some examples of legal and not legal. You know, byte. Well, we're starting out with a dollar sign. We can do that because it's uh, one of the special ones. So byte the value, character, test value. Double double's wrong, obviously, because double's a reserve word. And uh, integer rum and coke. Well, that and percent is wrong. And then uh, boolean true and false. Well, true or false. Um, not legal for two reasons. One, you have or, <laughs> and you have spaces. <laughs> you have a reserve word and you have spaces inside of this variable, so it's not going to work for both of those two reasons. We have uh, literal values. Literal values are the values that are constant. And here we have string literal, let's say, for example, hello world. Whole literal values, let's say 17 is an integer value. Decimals or character values, a V and A, C. Constant values or variables. When we initialize, we use the equals, which is different from the, from the comparison operator, which is the double equals. So we say integer i is equal to, is it equals, and then we give it, um, you know, it's an integer, so we have to give it a number, one, two, three, or something. So initializing or initializing variables means giving the variable some sort of starting or initial value. Just like Java, actually no, in Java some objects initialize the null. Uh, in C++ there's no initialized value, there's no null, so you get garbage. So when we say integer i, print i to the screen. Well, when we said integer i, the compiler went out and found the space that would fit i in memory, called it i. And when we say print it to the screen, it's going to print out whatever garbage happens to be located at i, which is going to be, you know, it's going to be weird symbols that print to the screen. Um, if you initialize it, you have to do it in one or two different steps. You can initialize it and declare it together. You can say integer i is equal to zero, semicolon. Or you can do two steps, integer i, semicolon i is equal to zero, semicolon. So you've got two separate kind of stages, and this is basically what these are examples are going to show you in the next uh, slide here. So the assignment operator is the equals the copies of the information from the right of the variable on the left, and must be comparable. So can be a literal or another variable. So integer i, semicolon, integer j, semicolon, i is equal to j, semicolon which has got one value that's equal to another value. Same thing in Java, actually. 
Here's an example, integer age, age is equal to 15. My character letter grade is equal to B. Character your grade is equal to letter grade. It's the same kind of examples. Why size matters. So we have big sizes and we have little sizes. We don't want to stuff a big variable into a small space. Uh, so what we have is each data type that takes up a certain amount of computer's memory. We can't put a larger data type variable into a smaller data type memory. Most of the errors come out of the first level type of programming in C++. They're called type mismatch errors, where you've got a string that you've assigned an integer to, or a double that you've assigned a float value to. Well, actually, it's hard to do that. An integer to a float or something. Where you've got mismatches, and you'll get a type mismatch error because the memory that's being reserved is very conservative. So here we have short s is equal to 5, long l is equal to s, and long l is equal to 5, short s is equal to 1. Well, one of them's going to fit, the other one's not going to fit. We can't take the long and stick it into the short space. But we can certainly take the short and put it into the long. That will work just fine. We have to keep this in mind when we start looking at typecasting. We've created a short and we want to stick it into a long space. We can cast it. And when I say typecasting, we change one type into another type. The C++ is, is considered strongly typed, so we have to give variables types. We have to say that i is an integer and f is a float. If we take f and stick it into i, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> because float values are going to store a certain number of precisions past the decimal point. i don't even have that. Our integers won't have that. So when we use a typecast function, we're saying, take f and turn it into an i. Well, then we lose value, we lose precision. So basically garbage in, garbage out. If we type doing, do type conversions, we're going to end up losing our precision. Actually. Operators, just like Java. Plus, minus, divide, subtract, um, opening and closing for order of precedence. So down in the bottom, we have an example here that says integer result is equal to, and then we do a calculation, and basically follows the same rules as Java, same rules as uh, algebra, actually. Left to right, inner to outer. So wherever we use brackets, it's going to resolve that value first and then substitute it in for that higher level value, and backwards, essentially, working inside out. Here's what I'm talking about when I say type casting. We don't actually have this in Java. Well, we do, but it's different. It's a method that we run. Here we run a function to type cast. And uh, here's an example here. This is what I'm talking about, like taking that float and putting it into an integer space. It occurs when you want to put something larger into a smaller space, eh, or vice versa. So it can possibly lose precision or value when you do that. Here's an example. Long my long is equal to 17. Short, my short is equal to short, and here's what I mean by typecasting. It's actually kind of the same as Java, um, where we say short, my long, which is taking my long, turning it into a short, and copying it into the variable my short, uh, which uh, should not necessarily be used that often, because you're squeezing a lot of big memory into a little space. You do that because you can't take and add together a short and a long, so if you have to make apples and apples for adding and subtracting and things because of the type language system, and things have to be liked. Otherwise, you get a type mismatch error. So if this is the first time you run into that error message, you'll be tempted to go back and typecast, and then you'll get the wrong. You won't get the error anymore, but you get the wrong answer. <laughs> There'll be some math problem that comes out with the wrong answer, or the different answer every time you do it, which means you just stuffed a big number into a small space and not all of it fit. So depending upon what was left out, well, your answer is going to vary. Not so good. So, um, that was a very, very, very quick review of variables, and uh, I'm hoping that you guys have programmed in and I. Some of you guys were in my Java course, so I know you guys have a little Java background. So, now we have conditionals and Boolean expressions, and I think um, I'm going to go through conditionals and Booleans. Maybe I'll make it through the whole thing, and then I'll end after this. I want to give this to you in small increments. <laughs> So you can go home and practice. It's going to take about three weeks to get through this lecture. It's 160 something slides. So. And we're, I don't know where, how far we are. But let's take a look at flow control and Boolean expressions. So we have control structures that 
control the flow of the program, and so we have a start and we have an end and we have a route to get there. And that's our if thens, our else's, our case switches, um, which basically are the same as Java and other programming languages. But if you ran into this, um, the concept is that we're controlling the flow of the execution. It's not event-driven programming. Um, event-driven programming is a GUI in which somebody clicks on an item. Flow control in a non-GUI is normally controlled by the program and its decision-making processes, depending upon the user behavior. Similar in concept, but the user is not in control of it. It's the program that's in control. It's not event-oriented. It's, it's program-oriented. So let's talk about the Boolean. The Boolean is something that resolves to one or zero, true or false. And uh, we can use Boolean as an integer, or we can actually use a Boolean character, uh, excuse me, variable type. Boolean variable type is going to give us a true or a false, which is um, better than a one or a zero because it makes more sense reading it. So you can get simple Booleans in several different ways, simple or complex. So these Booleans are used, and we'll talk about a little bit about that later, to make decisions to change the program behavior. So this would be if something is true. So the if uses a Boolean logic. So if and then you have opening and closing brackets saying x is bigger than 10. Well, it's going to resolve x is bigger than 10 always first. And it's going to say, is it true or false? If true, <laughs> if false. And so you're, you're controlling the flow with Booleans by logic. And then we have our relational operators that work with that. And so for primitive data types, we might have relational objects. You know, that's the greater than, the less than. And uh, here's the difference. We have the equals. If we use a single equal, which most of you will probably end up doing if this is the first time you've programmed in C++, you're going to say, if y is equal to x, and you'll use a single, you'll use a single equals, it will be an assignment symbol operator instead of a comparison operator. And then you've just assigned the value of x to y, uh, which is going to come back always true. <laughs> and uh, your whole loop's going to end uh, incorrectly. Uh, we have the not, the not equal to, the exclamation point. We'll see some examples coming up. The greater than or equal to, so we can nest them together. Note that all of these return us a true or false value. So if always works with a Boolean. Um, always returns a true or false. So here's some examples of uh, literal expressions, and I refer to them as literal expressions. So we have, um, you know, 5 is larger than 3, true. 6 is not equal to 6, false. 6 is equal to 6. Uh, you know, 4 less than or equal to 2, C doesn't equal B, you know, you can go through. So here's some variable examples. Integer number 1 is equal to 5. We can use numbers in our names for variables, that's legal. Short number 2 is equal to 7. Boolean result is equal to number 2 larger than number 1 the result is now true. So, we'll come back and it, it will always evaluate in terms of true and false for a Boolean. So. I'm just kind of interesting, you ask, you, you tell this concept to experience C++ programs, and they go, what? What do you mean by that? Because it makes no sense but logic-wise when you learn the language. But later on you think about it and go, yeah, everything always results in a Boolean. All comparisons are done, all flow control is done with Booleans. Either something is true or it's false. So the if, then, else is all implemented with booleans. Case is all implemented. Case switch is all booleans. Depends on how you can put it together. Put this is together. You can nest the booleans. If this is true, how about this? Is this true? How about that? Is that true? Is that true? Is that true? <laughs> That's like the hardest thing for new programmers who have never programmed in any language to kind of get a grasp of is how to control the flow of the program. So. We have the ands and the ors. So these are the operators that check for multiple conditions so we can nest them together. So and needs both the left and the right to be true in order for the actual value to be true. If this and this are true, so we go true, true, yep, false, false, true. Because <laughs> they're both the same. Uh, then or the or, which is either one or the other, so we have a true and a false together. Um, or if you use an or with a true and a true, it works as well. Because one of them is or, one of the truth. You need at least one truth out of the whole thing in order for uh, the or to work. You can't short, uh, can be shortcutted if necessary, as an example here. 
We have 6 is larger than 5, and C is equal to B. Okay, true, false, you know, depending upon where you go. So you, basically, you put in like, expressions, and you go, you know, with, with so, and this is, a, an, again, uh, representing how you would use the brackets to nest certain pieces of code that you want to be evaluated separately. So. Now let's do something. Okay, so let, let's put all the pieces together and show you the flow control. So using the if statement, uh, we can decide whether or not to execute some of the code here. So here's our format. It has the format if some Boolean value. You can actually put in here if and a variable name. And this is, uh, this is how you know the person actually knows how to program versus following the syntax rules. <laughs> if i, you see if i, and if i is true or false, and then i gets evaluated somewhere else, if it's true, and then the if statement is going to work. If it's false, the if statement is not going to work. But normally you see a Boolean expression. If i is less than 5, okay, it is. If i is, or you see integer i is equal to 1, and uh, or integer i is equal to some input that the user gave, and if it's actual integer value, it comes back with true. Because all functions and all assignments always return true. So if integer i is equal to 1, and it equals 1, you're good. Or i is equal to 1 is a true statement. i is equal to this variable that the gave, user gave, and the user gave a, a b or an a, and not a number, that's going to come back with false. So that's how you can actually check input. Sometimes you'll see this used a lot in terms of, did the user actually enter a number between 1 and 5? Nope, they entered a character. Then if the value doesn't assign correctly, it comes back false. Because it's a strongly top language, you could try to take a character and initialize an integer variable with a character, it's going to come back false. Initialize it with a number, it comes back true. So you can use it for error checking, you can use it for flow control, all sorts of different purposes. And so inside the opening and closing bracket, just like the main program, we have all the code that goes in here to execute if the boolean comes back true. The above statement is true, do all this stuff. Here's an example of some real source code. Uh, so we have, uh, this looks like our hello world again. And if you just came in, you missed everything from the beginning. This is lecture one, the C++ boot camp. Um, so we have this statement that I've already talked about. We have this statement that I briefly mentioned, this using namespace, which we don't have in Java. Uh, we don't have it in any other language. It's a C++ specific thing. The reason why we had that, in fact, we didn't have it originally came along with C++, not C. Um, it got backward compatible to C. Here's the problem. So you can use libraries. Not everything's built into the main functions. Like, for example, here's a library up here, include IO stream. What if we had include this other library that came from a third party company that sold drivers for uh, our scanner board? And we're writing a program that works with a scanner board, and we're going to include this library. What if the library's got a redefinition of some of the C's and C outs or something. It's got something that is duplicated in terms of the variable names of some of the functions and library features. How's it going to know which one to use? It's not going to. <laughs> so we define namespaces that are uh, environment variables, so environment spaces. And we say using namespace standard and we run some code and we can switch it and say using namespace my namespace. And uh, after the bootcamp, I'll, I'll tell you how to, we'll go through how to create the namespaces and use them in a more formal way. But uh, we change the namespaces, that way we can change library sets. Standard has all of the built-in standard ANSI compatible C and C++ libraries already included. So the names are always going to default back to what's in, as an example, iostream.h. If we had another library that had a duplicate name, we weren't using the standard, it may not necessarily do that. It might default back to something else. So. But that's something brand new from Java that doesn't exist in Java. We have no names. Well, no, we don't have any namespaces in Java. Uh, okay, so void main, we're familiar with that already. It doesn't return a value. Uh, integer star is equal to 5, integer n is equal to 19. A couple of variable declarations and initializations all in one line. If start is smaller than n, is start smaller than n, 5 is smaller than 19, it's going to evaluate to true. Then uh, we have our opening and closing brackets here. 
and we have our end if here. Uh, it's going to close it for us, and it says it's going to see out. Remember that see out. We have the quotation marks for A here, so we're going to blow out the horn A, and then uh, see out B. Otherwise, we're going to see out B. So what's going to happen? Actually, in this example, both. I never printed. I'm going to say A and B to the screen actually, because <laughs> this is outside. See out B is going to be outside, so. Output is A and B. Now, if start was not smaller than N, it would only print out B. Because we're outside of the block of the control. This is where people run into 99.9% .9 of all the problems with the if then statement. I haven't done the if then yet, but just the if. This is where the problems come into play because they put it outside of the bracket. They, you know, if you wanted it inside the bracket, you should have put it inside the bracket. <laughs> you put it outside. It's going to print out every time the program runs, essentially. Part two, let's change it around a little bit. Now we have uh, if start is larger than end, it's not. It's going to be false. So this is going to evaluate to false. This will only run if it's true. So if it's only one you have to really remember in terms of flow control. Oh, it's always true. Runs. False never runs. So. Um, and we're still going to print out the B, but it's not going to print out the A, it's just going to print out the B. Same thing actually true for Java. For those people who are still learning Java, this is a good review of the languages as well. We have else's, same thing in Java as well. If else, then we have if has a counterpart, and it's the else statement that's nested. So if the if clause didn't execute, then the else, else clause will. Well, not both, just one or the other. Uh, so it has the format if some Boolean expression evaluates to true, so the statement that executes the Boolean is true, then this one will go. And we have our opening and closing brackets, which is kind of interesting. Some people like to put the else on the top line, put the else on, you know, like here, so it's like all of them together. You can do that. But this is easier to see. And in terms of uh, programming syntax, you can put the whole program on one line just the same way as you do in Java. So this is for readability. Um, people with C++, they take it as a craft. They like to get, you know, they like to nest. They like to put everything all together. It makes it hard to read, actually, but it makes it short, simple. More so than Java, because you have more things you can do in C++, more syntax. Now it's pretty basic. It's not, they pulled out some of the extra stuff that C++ has. Uh, notice that uh, only one set of the statements executes no matter what. So if you have a single else, only one. So here we go back to our example where I've uh, replaced, we put an else in here. So now we got rid of it so the A and the B don't print out together. So either A or B is going to print out. In this case we have that the start is larger than the end, which it isn't. Uh, so we've got B that gets printed out because A isn't true, A is false. Or the if statement turns out to be false and not true. And now, uh, did we change the code? Yes, we changed the code. This little arrow changed. So now we have, if start is smaller than n, start is smaller than n, then that one's true. So we get A and but not B. So now we have A that prints out, but that else will take away the B. You can put ifs else inside of if else, and that if else 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 25 times down the road. <laughs> but that's really kind of hard to read. So when you have multiple select, we go with a case switch case instead of the if else's. But either one of them will actually work, they're both correct. It's just one's more readable than the other. So we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. Else ifs. So we can say, well, we don't want an else, but the else we don't want the B to print to the screen, let's say. But if we get another true, this one's not true, but that one's true. So the else is going to basically give us an else is. So selecting from uh, one from many different options. So we can nest it together as soon as one of the true statements is encountered, something's going to print, and then the whole structure is going to end. So in here we have, you know, if some expression, else if. Else if, else if. Uh, brand new programmers never like to use this for some reason. They'll go, if else, and then they'll go again, if else, and they'll go again, if else. <laughs> we'll put the 
Here's some nails. Here's some nails. Here's some. They'll put like five of them. All they have to do is basically make one structure and go if, and then go five, else if, else if, else if. <laughs> Nest it together. Make it uh, all in one package. Here's an example. Combining it with an else ifs. Um, that's the same reason why a lot of programmers don't like this. You know, turn, cuts down on readability. And this is put in here on purpose to show you. You can initialize everything all on one line if you want. Just separate them by semicolons. So we have a start is 5, a middle is 8, end is 19. <laughs> kind of hard to read. If the start is smaller than middle, is a start smaller than middle? Yes, it is. Um, then print to the screen A. Um, else, if... Start uh, start is smaller than end. Is start so smaller than end? It is actually. Then uh, print out B. We have A because it's gonna find the first one and stop. The case switch does them all. <laughs> well, print them all until you break it, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But that's why it's because. And a lot of people actually experience C++ programs and never really understand, why do we have both? That one won't go through everything and it stops at the first true and ends. The case switch does everything, whether it's true or false. It was a kind of an interesting uh, structure that was put in to take care of that problem, actually, which is kind of weird. So. And uh, that's the interesting thing you'll notice with C++ that you won't notice with Java. Java's cleaned up. <sighs> Java, there's only one function for something. And it always works the same way, and it's all object, it's pure object oriented. C++, you got a million functions that do the same thing. <laughs> and nothing is consistent. Some things can be returned from a function, some things can't. Some things get passed by value, some things get passed by reference. It's inconsistent in its own use of its own features, because as it evolved as a programming language, they just kept adding to it, and adding to it, and adding to it, and adding to it. C++ was never written like all in one shot as C++. Java was. <laughs> so the people that made Java kind of well, take a look at C++ and refactor in all of the weirdness about it, get rid of some of the inconsistencies, write it fresh from the ground up, and then we got Java. So in a lot of ways, people find learning Java a lot easier than C++ because it's more consistent, more standard as a language, not quite as many weird, weird side effects and things that come out of it, so. Uh, so let's see, we got the uh, else catch all kind of statement here where we have a combination here, we have an else if, and then we have an else. This is kind of like the default in the case switch, if you're familiar with that already. Um, so we have the same programming code as before. We have the start is larger than middle. It's not. Else if start is larger than end. It's not. Then we're going to have C printed to the screen because it's going to, the first two are going to come back false, false, and then we're going to get no choice but to do C at the end. So C shows up at the end. So you can nest the else's with the else's. And let me tell you right now, you're never going to learn any of this stuff by reading through the slide set, but the slide set's easier to see than the code that I'm writing. In. <laughs> if you were here earlier when I was showing you the dev C, it's kind of small. I've got to figure out how to make it bigger. But uh, next week, I'm going to actually have some programs for you to we'll go through line by line and we'll see the stuff work. Because uh, you really need to practice with it. And that's actually the theme of the first assignment that I'm going to go over at the, end of, uh, at the end of this particular lecture today. So kind of the previews, what's in store for you. Um, the switch statement. So this is why we keep calling switch case, case switch. Uh, so simply the else if statement for primitive data types. Um, so we're trying to find a match, the same concept as before. Except for now, instead of going true, true, false, false, we're going, is it a match? Does it equal this? Does it equal that? Does it equal this? And it tries them all. It doesn't stop when it first finds a particular value that is equal. So uh, you have to tell it to stop by using a break keyword. And this is the biggest problem that a lot of uh, people forget and uh, you can actually use them all. If a match exists, we will try the first one, we'll try the second one, we'll try the third one. So you can use it for its built-in feature of going through all of the options. Or you can execute it as a, and use a break to end it. And use it kind of like an else if, else if, else if. But it's really a case. Here's an example. So we have um, 
the same program that you've been looking at so far today with the namespace and the include and the main. Now we have integer uh, my integer is equal to one switch my int, which is the syntax so we'll say we're sending my int the integer to the switch statement. And now we're going to go case one colon C out. Case two, case three. It's actually doing a comparison. Does my int equal case one? It only works with primitives. So we can use it with characters, we can use it with numbers. We can't use it with user defined data types. So if we had a structure, not going to work. <laughs> Unless we pull a piece of data out of the structure and use that. And you don't know what structures are, I'll cover that next week. Uh, but. And then we end a switch. So this actually prints out A, B, and C. Why? Because they all get executed. Case one, case two, case three. There's no, it doesn't work the same way. And this is the biggest confusion for people who, who are learning this. It doesn't work like the if, else, else if. It goes and everything inside of the case, everything inside of the switch, all these cases will execute. So it'll, it'll print out case one, case two, case three, case four, even though it's not equal. That's why you have to use the break. So we fix it by putting a break in here. The break says stop, we're done. <laughs> so if an uh, example of my integer is equal to one here, then, uh, and in the previous example, my integer was also equal to one, but we have A, B, and C coming out on the screen. Now we're going to have just A will print out because the break here stops it. It says get out of, it's not an exit, not to be confused with exit, which will close your program. Break will actually exit you out of the current construct. Break can be used with loops, can be used with case, can be used with if else then statements, can be used with anything, actually. Uh, so it's a universal word that says stop. We have default as a keyword that works with the statement as well. Same thing as the else keyword in the else if. So before we had that else where B printed out because the else ifs didn't work. So we can get down to the bottom, it's all a catch all. So we have the format of a switch, some primitive variable that we're putting into the switch. Case one, case two, case three. Default, <laughs> which means none of them work to print out the default. So here we go, we put breaks in there, because if one of them works, we're going to break out of it. Otherwise, we're going to get the default that comes out. And here's our default here, because integer, my integer now is equal to 5. So it's not equal to 1, not equal to 2. Well, what else is it equal to? We don't care, just do the default action. So default will happen regardless. If it makes it down here, because you have to think that the structure goes sequentially. So we'll go one, two, three. So if we broke it, default's never going to work. But if it, none of these work, then default's actually going to print. So it'll end up making it to the default. So it only prints out C because of the default that's in there. If you leave the default out, it prints out A and B <laughs> without the breaks. But the breaks is going to print out either A or B without the default. <coughs> Does that make sense? Am I going too fast? Check over looping. Should I look at the first program? Yeah, let's look at the first program. I feel like I'm going to. I, you need to digest this a little bit. So, uh, We're going to start looping, actually. Next time we're going to start doing looping. We're not done yet, though. I want to show you the first assignment so you know what you're supposed to be working towards. And uh, if you came in late, your homework assignment <laughs> which is not really due anytime, really. So download a compiler <laughs> and uh, try to run Hello World. Cut and paste the code from the lecture. It's lecture number one. Or go into and select new project and select console application. Make sure your compiler is running correctly. Because next week I'm going to start showing you more code. Because I'm going to cover it in looping next week and then we'll start putting the pieces together. The only way to really see it, to understand it, is to uh, practice it. You can't learn programming by listening to me talk, so it doesn't work that way. Uh, so let's take a look here real quickly then, at uh, unless someone has any questions right now. At um, Actually, you know, I'll just leave this up. Any brand new people here? No? You have, well, you have been taking classes from me before, so you know. Um, Oh, my upload failed. Great. You know about the bhacker.com website then? Yeah. 
And after this particular class, I have last week's lecture up there. And you know why it failed? The internet is not. Oh, no, it's back. Okay, good. We are in object oriented programming with C. We have these assignments here. And so the way, only way really to learn this, this stuff is actually to go through the assignment. So assignment number one, I kind of want to preview because some of you actually have done it already. I've had some students submit it already, which uh, is like way, uh, way early, I should say. Well, let's take a look at this animal. It's not hard. It's actually kind of easy. It basically gets you up and started, up and running. And, uh, it's taking a few minutes. The internet is a little bit challenging today. Oh, there we go. So um, install your compiler and then start thinking about this particular program. And this particular program is going to oops, get you uh, hopefully refreshed and up to speed if you've ever programmed in C before. Otherwise, it's going to be a challenge for you, but not too bad of a challenge. If it's your first C++ program you've ever written, if you know Java, you can pretty much do it kind of easily. And uh, if you're, this is your first C++ class, I would get this the book that I've mentioned in the syllabus, uh, because it's going to go at a lot slower pace. It's going to basically show you everything from computer science 101 <laughs> to how to write C programs. Uh, so your first program is design uh, need help getting back into the swing of things. So this program is to help you sort of get back into the swing of things. It's not a complicated one. I'm actually going to give you the algorithm to use. Um, so the main goal is to write a simple program using functions and familiarize yourself. So you have to create a function. You call a function, and I'm going to be talking about that next week, actually. Um, create a function, call a function from within the C program. And the function, I'm going to give you the code for it. This actually comes out of the textbook that I have um, in the syllabus. And you don't have to have the textbook because I have copied and cut and pasted the code here. So you have the text of the code. What are you doing? You're writing a program that determines the day of the week given a date. So it's kind of like the Julian date. So if I said that today's date was 6-1-2011, and I said my program, it said enter date. I put in 6-1, it's going to tell me Today is Wednesday. And it knows that by looking at the Julian calendar and figuring out the day of the week. And I'm giving you the algorithm. You don't have to write that on your own. Um, so what do you have here? You have to actually ask for input, or you have to pull the input from the command line. So you can say, my program 1 space 61 2011. Mm -hmm. Taking it from the command line prompt, parsing it, bringing it in, a little bit harder. Your program can simply say, hi, <laughs> enter a date. You enter the date. Today's Wednesday. Bye. That's what your program is doing. So it's giving you the ability to compile a program in C++, ask for input, call a function, and print, it, print something to the screen, and it closes the program. Not too bad. It's a great starting point. It gets everybody on the same page, hopefully. And it tests to make sure you can actually go through the compilation process and everything. So what are you going to do here? <clears throat> so you can invent your own complex algorithm, or you can use the one that's below. Uh, the, all this verbiage goes through the algorithm. I'm going to hopefully remember and put the source code out there for you. So next week I'll be showing you some example programs that you can run through. And I'm, I'm going to create... I don't believe it's out there yet. I'm going to create a function that does it for you. So all you have to do is call the function. <laughs> Actually, no, I won't do that. I'll create a program that calculates the Julian date for you. It gives you the source code for it. That way you can just call and use the, use the information that's already written in C++ for you. You do have to use the C in and the C out library for it. I don't want you to use printf and scanf, which is the C equivalent to standard I.O. So you'll have to make sure that you can actually you know, use the C in and C out as well. So very limited. I'm going to let you read through. So it's not a bad idea to read through this description of the program as well. Next week, I'll demo the sample program that I put out there for you. And then we'll go back through and we'll review for the people that are brand new to this and get everybody up on the same page. 
usually I kind of like to try to take the beginning just to kind of first couple of weeks of this class is going to be kind of boring to people who already know how to program MC. And it's going to be very fast paced for those people who don't. So, <laughs> and I hopefully will bridge the gap between the two different groups, hopefully. Uh, we'll see how that happens. Uh, but if you ever do have any questions, once you put together, get your compiler installed, you're going to send me an email message. I'm going to put together a YouTube video on how to install DOC++. So I'll go through the download that I need. So same thing I did for the Java class, if you took that, so you can get your compiler up. And then I'll run through Hello World for you as well. So. But that's, I have to do it. I haven't done it yet, so. In the start of the term, I have to kind of build up the video collection. So. Questions? You guys are having sleep. I think it's because the lights are turned off. Right now. <laughs> yeah, then we'll make it easy. We're done for today. I'll see you next week. Cool. Oh. All right. Thank you.